it's not close to 5 30 when we get out um, be sure you partake in the, in the refreshments that we have over there um it's all courtesy and from our grant from the higher education coordinating board um, they funded us to have this series of speaker it's called speaker series regarding our retention and equity diversity inclusion that those topics and it all goes hand in hand with each other our planning grant that we received from the coordinating board is just that it's a planning grant and the work that you are going to do here and the faculty did earlier this month and my team is going to do on the 30th will all play into how we move forward with a larger $250,000 grant we're going to apply for to continue this work on our, our institution, improving access for our students, improving retention, improving our uh, lens through equity and inclusion, and all the work that we're going to do to progress with our new strategic plan. In addition, the work that we will do in that planning grant, or this planning grant, and the upcoming grant, will play into our QEP for our quality enhancement plan for our SACS reaffirmation in 2025. And I know you say that's way, way off, we're only in 2022. We're, we're already in the process of planning the QEP. We have to have that done and submitted in 2024. So the work is being done, and all of this helps with that. So with that being said, we chose uh, Dr. Joe Carol Fabianke to be our speaker for this series. Um, I'm going to read her bio, uh, but as I said to the faculty, uh, our paths have crossed over the years, but I haven't had an opportunity to work as closely with her as I've had the past, what, two months maybe, and it's been a joy. So let me read her bio so that you know the excellent credentials that that she has and, and the experience that she's bringing to this table. Dr. Fabianchi served as the Vice Chancellor for Academic Success for the Alamo Colleges from 2012 through 2017, working with five colleges in the district on academic initiatives focused on increasing student success. Her leadership roles include building collaboration among the faculty across the colleges since the district joined Achieving the Dream in the first cohort in 2024, I mean 20, 2004, and serving as the lead for the AACC Pathways Program. Since her retirement, Dr. Fabianchi has been involved with Pathways and other academic initiatives with colleges across the country. She served as a coach for AACC Pathways 2.0 and works with the Texas Success, Texas Success Center's Texas Pathways Program. Dr. Fabianchi also serves as a coach for IEBC's Caring Campus work with colleges across the country. Her initial assignment with the Alamo Colleges was as a professor at San Antonio College, where she taught for 24 years and received the Texas Excellence Award before advancing her career to leadership roles, including serving as the first director of institutional effectiveness, co-director of the reaffirmation of accreditation and district policy liaison. She was the first vice president of academics at Northwest Vista College. Through these roles, Dr. Fabianchi demonstrated her ability to work with disparate groups towards consensus through clarification of options, resolving issues, and understanding the needs of various stakeholders. So with that experience, you know we're in good hands, aren't we? We really appreciate her coming, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Oh, before I do, before, when you leave, please pick up a, a book. We only have enough for the, the groups here, and some of them that weren't um, can't come. We're going to get it to them. So don't don't take it for somebody that wasn't here. We'll get it to them. Thank you so much. And Dr. Parker. Hello, everybody. Every time somebody reads that, it just makes me know how old I am because I've done all that stuff. Um, and I know that you are the leadership. You are the leadership at Central Texas College. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to, I guess it was full-time faculty only, um, the first, second day they were back here uh, for the beginning of the term. And now you as leadership, and then uh, as stated, I'll be working or talking with 
the student success people. You're in the middle for a reason. And that's because we're not going to move anything forward here that you don't believe in and endorse. So um, let's get started. And you see there's paper in the middle of the table. That means you're going to get to do something. So, uh, you know, there's always a cost for food. So <laughs> be sure to go over any time and get more snacks. And uh, I'm going to move this along so that we can have at least 30 minutes for you to do some work uh, before we close. And I'm not going to be keeping you till 5.30 um, for schedule for 4.30. So here we go. Uh, first of all, and I, I'd like for you to be participating all through this. Look at this list of things. And with the people at your table, did you do any of these things as a young person? And I'm just going to give you like two or three minutes. So we're not going to delve into this. Uh, just say yes or no, I did want one of them. And what effect did that have on you, short or long term? So just a couple of minutes, go. <laughs> One more, anybody. Thank you. That's perfect. Anybody? Right here? Go ahead. Hello? Yes. Hey, how's everybody doing? Uh, Jose uh, from Spiritual Effectiveness. Um, so I was in a local high school band here. I was in high school, people. Uh, graduate of 93. Uh, and we were a very, very good band. Um, <laughs> of course. So much so that you know, won multiple awards. Um, but what that did, being a participant as a drummer in the band, made me very, very competitive. So as an adult, I just everything that was a challenge to me was how to compete. And I'll bet that through that you you gained some confidence yes, and some stick to itiveness. You know, I told my children I had a daughter that wanted to do everything but didn't want to continue anything <laughs> past about two weeks because it meant she might have to actually do something. And I'd say, no, you've signed up for this. And who suffered from that? Me. Uh, not her. But uh, think how many people you know probably didn't have this opportunity at all. I'll bet there are people in your classes that didn't do any of these things. And that makes a difference. And we'll talk even more about that in a minute. Would you like to take a minute? We want to welcome our chancellor. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome, all of you. 
thought I was here on time, right? <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, I'm glad to see all of you here and participating. And so, when did you graduate? 97. Oh, pretty close, 93. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. I, I hope we're going to gain a lot. I know we are. I know we're not going to the door. So, okay. All right. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Isn't it great that the leader would take this time to be here? Well, part of what we want to talk about today, and I know you're probably all familiar with this quote, it's important how we make people feel, how we make people feel when they just come in this room, uh, and it is so important, and I want you to keep that in mind as we move along in here. And by the way, stop me anytime if you've got a question. So, just a little bit of data about you, and I know you're the leadership, you see this, but you know, you see it sort of flashing by and uh, maybe you haven't paid a lot of attention to it in a while. And so I wanted to point some of this out. You know, I like every other community college in Texas, as well as across the country, a majority part-time students. That means those part-time students are really in a balancing act between being in school and having the rest of their life going on. And so we know that if they're taking two classes here, uh, they're probably taking two classes because they've got a lot of other things going on. And this is hard for this to be a real priority for them. And uh, it's important that we recognize that. I also want to point out the breakdown. Some of you may have been in here when we talked about this when I was here in August, but you have about equal breakout of white, Hispanic, African-American. And that's a little bit unusual. I live in San Antonio and we're majority Hispanic, only about 10% African-American and 35 or so percent Anglo. Yours is much more evenly spread. And I looked at 2018 because I know I'm going to give you a couple of other data points. And I know you're going to tell me that 2020 was different. And boy, do I know it was different. And I was glad I was retired, by the way. Uh, and as leadership, I know the struggles you must have had trying to deal with all of the changes that uh, you start out probably at spring break. And when you come back from spring break, everything shut down. But the breakdown was about the same in 2018. So again, if you've got any questions, stop. Me. Now, I hope you can see this. I wanted, because somebody asked, you know, what's the breakdown by location? And, and this, by the way, all of this data comes from data you submitted to the coordinating board. So. Uh, I, I didn't make any of this up. Um, but you can see that in state in 2021, so this was a whole year's worth, you had a lot of students that were in Texas, maybe not in your service area, but in the state. And then you can see the breakdown of the others and note how many were distance only. Now that was 2020, and we know the reason for that. But I'm going to guess you're still, you still got a lot of distance because students got used to not having to drive here and being able to do their work at night or whenever they, they, change, they would choose to do it. And so we want to be sure those students probably have a little bit different need than those that are coming on your campus and a lot less connecting. And remember back that slide about how we make people feel. So what happened to the fall 2020 FTIC cohort? Well, this is how many you had the enrollment. You can see the breakdown. And again, it's about a third uh, each of those. That's what I showed you on the slide. And in, in 20. Uh, 18, it was still about the same. Now in 2018, instead of 770, 
you had 1,071. So you had, you know, 300 more students, but the breakdown was still about the same. And think how excited they were. You know, there may be many of them who just got out of high school or they were thinking that they could come to college and be successful and they're going to get a better job and they're going to set an example for their children and all the other things that you know that new students believe. They were all excited. Well, let's see what happened to them. So, how many completed six hours? How many complete? I have to have notes because that otherwise I would be here till 530. So I got to keep myself moving on. So forgive me for that. Um, yes. No, next one. Thank you. So how many completed six hours in the first term? And you can see that it was 59%. Now, interestingly, in fall 2018, it was 58%. So that means all of the things that you were doing because of COVID were still, you had the same level of success that you had before. And look at the breakdown. That means five out of 10 African-American students did not earn six hours. And you can see the others. Now we know that momentum is a big thing. And if I can't earn six hours in one semester, and maybe your average number of, of hours, like it is a lot of places, is more like six to nine, something like that. But if I didn't pass anything, we hope that you know they passed at least two classes. That, that's the stickiness that keeps them um, coming back. And I was all excited. And believe me, when they come here for the first time, they don't, they think they're going to succeed. They're convinced they are. And so we need to be thinking about how we can help them to be sure to do that. Okay, six hours in the first term. Well, how many of them persisted? Well, you can see here that now these are the 412 is of the 770. So it's not of those that earned six hours who persisted. It's of the total who persisted. But, you know, if they don't come back the second term, they're very likely not to come back or to wait a long time to come back. And you've got thousands of students in this area that have some college, but no credential. So it's really, really important that tr we try to ensure that we can get them to persist. Now, isn't it interesting that we have 3% more students, African American, that persisted than our six hours? And of course, those two numbers, as I said, don't go together. Now, this is the one thing, in 2018, the percentages were about 10% higher for each one of these groups, 10 to 15% higher. So, you know, it, it, there was a lot of difficulty in, in 2020 about uh, being able to hang on, a lot of things going on. The last one in this, how many completed 15 hours in a year? Now, you may say, that's too many hours. But I, if I earn 15 hours a year, it's going to take me four hours to get a two-year degree. I mean, four years to get a two-year degree. And it's going to take me eight years, eight years to get a four-year degree. So we really need to encourage students one, to be closer to full-time, and remember they get more financial aid if they're full-time, and we need to help them stay here because a lot of things in life change over all of those years. So if not, they didn't earn 15 hours. That means seven out of 10 African-Americans 
didn't earn 15 hours. Now, we don't know how many they took. I get that. But that's part of our responsibility, too, is to help them to know they need to take more hours so they can finish more hours. We've got to remember they don't know what they don't know. And we've got to help them know that. So 39% earn 15 hours. And interestingly enough, uh, for uh, 2018, it was 41%. So there was only two percentage points difference between 2018 and 2020. So we really can't say that there was a lot of difference They've been pretty consistent. Now, I'm going to give you a chance in a minute to have a little discussion about this. Now, what we're here today to talk about is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, these are not, we hear, we've been talking about these things for years, as long, even back long before I retired. We would say at Alamo College, as you know, We've got to get into equity. We've got to figure out what to do to make sure we're giving every opportunity to the students the opportunities that they need. And then we'd say, well, what does that mean? And what does it mean to me? And today we're still talking about the same thing. So that's really our focus here for the next hour is to talk about these three things. And I, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. This is not about politics. It's not about anything that you're hearing on the TV today. This is about serving students. And that's, all, that's the only place we're going with this, serving students. So let's start out first about what are these three things? Because I think we kind of use them interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. So here's a nice long definition for diversity, and I'm going to let you look at it. But what I'm going to say about it, it's really about recognizing differences. And just look at that list of all of the differences that are listed up there, and that's not a full list. That's just part of the list. And if we took the time today, even at your own table, to say, would you say how you got here today? You know, what's your background? Where did you come from? You know, what did your parents do? We could go through all of those things, and we find there's differences for everybody in this, in this room. And that's good. We want that. That means we have a richer environment and many different thoughts and we want, to, we want to have that. So diversity is about recognizing differences. Diversity. Now, equity. Equity is about trying to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to progress to their potential. I read one example that said, equity is not about just making sure everybody has a laptop. Equity is about making sure they have the access for the laptop and know how to use it and how to choose the right material that they can find on the laptop. Equity is not just opening the door for everybody is creating a path to get through the door for everybody. And so when you look at this, it's about fair and just access based on all of that diversity we had in the first one. So we want to address those differences. Now the third one was inclusion. And that seems like that's pretty simple. It's including everybody, right? 
But I would say, not purposely, but we don't include everybody now. And maybe the reason, some of the reasons why we don't include everybody is that they're not saying, oh, don't forget me. You know, back on that very first slide, you got to do things when you were growing up and you sort of learned some confidence. You don't mind. And when I was vice president at Northwest Vista College, and it was a brand new college, and they really put a lot of focus on um, active learning and students asking questions. And then faculty would come to me and say, they're asking questions. <laughs> and I'd say, I know, I know, we got to be ready for that. Uh, but you have students that are afraid to ask questions. They come into your room, sit in the back, and they never even make eye contact because they're afraid of what's going to happen. So inclusion is to make sure I've done it again. Inclusion is to make sure that uh, we've got um, active, intentional, and ongoing uh, engagement. So now you think you got the three and the difference between them, among them? Yeah, here we go. More. Now, Here's a short definition, and that's on the handout that's on your table. Uh, diversity, recognizing human differences. Equity, being fair to every individual student, giving them an opportunity. And notice that it says ensure, that ensure all campus community members can thrive. Now this doesn't mean everybody's gonna, we're not gonna, we're not lowering the standards, we're not, we're not trying to make this so that we we have every every single person be successful. This is about giving them the opportunity to be successful. And then inclusion. Now, equality and equity sound very close. And they're not the same thing at all. Equality is about essential sameness. It focusing, focuses on making sure everybody gets the same thing. That we got all that food over there and everybody had an equal opportunity to get all one. Some of you have better restraint than others, but that's another thing. But equity is about fairness. It's about fairness. And it is ensuring that each person gets what they need. See the difference in the two? They're not anywhere near the same thing. Here's an example. On the left, we want to provide an opportunity for these people to see the game. And there's a fence because they can't go out on the field, but they can see the game from the fence. And so everybody has an equal opportunity to see the game. They were invited in. But two of them, the one in the middle is having a really hard time. She's on her tiptoes. And the one next to her has no chance. But on the right, we've tried to provide the equity, meaning that there are um, some ways to provide help there. Notice the, the boxes for the girl in the middle and the ramp for the child in the wheelchair. Now, they may have had to help get those things set up. It's not that it, we're not, it doesn't mean you give everybody everything. 
but it does mean that we recognize and try to help people to have a chance so then everybody can see the game. So here, for a couple of minutes at the table, and please, this is an opportunity, and you're sitting with people in your area. And we did that on purpose, and you'll see, not for this particular set of talking uh, questions, but for the ones that we're going to do here in a little bit, you're sitting with a group uh, of your peers in your area. But for right now, what are your thoughts based on what we've seen so far? Are who's not being served? CTC students. Who's not being served? And which of your students are likely disconnected and most likely to leave? So think about the students in your classes or think about. Uh, if you're in one of the um, in one of the service areas, think about you. You know who the students here are, and you've got neighbors and children and others that are uh, enrolled at CTC. And we uh, we've already pointed out two people that even went to high school here, and I'm sure there's many others in here. By the way, I told the group uh, at at in uh, August. While you're thinking about these for a second. I'm from Rosebud, Texas, actually. I'm assuming some of you may know where that is. Uh, it's on Highway 77, south of Waco, east of Temple. So, you know, I'm a central Texas person, too. Uh, it wasn't quite as big as this, so there wasn't anything for me to do to stay there. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, I love this part of Texas. Uh, and what are the institutional weak spots for Central Texas College when you begin to talk about diver diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you have any question in your mind about supporting those three things, have that discussion at your table. Because when we leave here today, if we don't have this group that is at least open to really considering how we're going to recognize diversity, include everybody, and create opportunities across everything that's done at Central Texas College, we're never going to get there. Because your group, the people under you that work with you, are going to be looking to you to see what you think about this thing. So, uh, maybe five minutes or so, you, you, when I start hearing you kind of settle down, then I'll bring us back together. So go. <laughs> yeah, don't leave. The chancellor says don't leave. <laughs>
I think that students, and I teach math, so I think that students who are in North Carolina that want to take a math class but don't want to take it online and want to take it SVL should have the opportunity to do so. However, they are not because we can't code them that way. So I think we have a coding issue of students who are online versus SVL who want to take an SVL class to be able to do so. And so we don't have that right now. So tell those me, students are getting lost. Tell me your first name. Um, Audrey. Audrey, you just panned right into our discussion in a little bit. Okay. I, I must have planted you out there. Thank you so much. You provided cookies, so. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You know. Oh, I was going to say, and then another thing that we had talked about is, um, oh, I want to thank you so much for coming and, and just giving us the opportunity to talk, but really training. So we're talking about DEI and thinking about, okay, for example, some students may not be want to may not be wanted to be called something or we want to be called a nickname, uh, cultural, uh, um, you know, different, absolutely. right? And so I don't really feel like I've been trained with the things that are coming out to say, hey, this is how you handle that situation. Thank and you. so something super easy is adding a notes column in Blackboard or something like that where I can put nicknames or put gender preferences or whatever they want for me to do so that I can respect their choice. For me to have something like that would seem so easy. Yeah, we don't have it. So just things like that. And you know, it's not training because you don't know how to do it. It's training to increase your awareness of doing it as much as anything else. It is it is thinking about how to create equity as much as anything. Those are great examples. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Who else? I know this is not a quiet shot group. Come on, you're the leaders. Who wants to share? Somebody make an eye contact. Does that mean you'll talk? Okay, you'll talk. <laughs> Tammy Samaritha, the department chair for health sciences. So um, my group discussed a little bit about um, the working student. So the student that perhaps works during the day, do we have enough course offerings to serve the students in the evenings and the weekends? And so that's what I'm talking about. Great minds think alike. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other was first time in college. So our students that are coming in that are first time students, um, do we have enough resources at the beginning stage, like when they're first getting here and they've never done this process? Do we have enough resources to get them through the process so they're not overwhelmed and they can successfully make it into the program? Because some of our programs, it's not as easy as just registering for math. So, for example, like our programs, they register for the college. There's a process there. Then they register for a program. There's a process there. And so, you know, some programs have multiple processes, and how do we serve a first time in college student? Perfect. Two things. One is, you know, students graduate from high school first of June, and when they come to us the third week in August, we think they already, already know how to be a college student, and they don't. And the other is, you know, San Antonio is very military. And I remember uh, a guy who had been on several tours of duty, and uh, he said it was as frightening for him to get out of his car and walk in to begin the registration process as it was to do anything that he did, because he had no idea how to do that. So you're perfect examples. One more, somebody, anybody? Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Okay, you're going to get your chance here in a minute again. Here we go. Now, we got to create the equity mindset. It's okay to come in here and we talk about it for an hour and a half, and pretty much, I mean, so far, most anything I've said, you wouldn't go, no, I don't believe that. I mean, most everybody in here would say, yeah, those are important things. And I want to be sure that, you know, we've done these things for our students. 
but to have it sort of be more permanent, we ought to create the Mac, the uh, equity mindset. And how do we do that? Do you believe that a sense of belonging and efficacy is critical to student success? If you don't, be sure to pick one of these up when you leave. <laughs> There's a chapter in here for faculty. There's stuff spread all through it for staff. There's college-wide. And basically what it means is it's all about relationships. Most everything we do is about relationships. And that's where we get our traction. That's where we get our stick to itiveness is by uh, having a sense of belonging. So we've got to believe that first. And then it's important that we realize that you have students that probably went to a low performing school. That maybe didn't, they didn't have every opportunity that a lot of students have. And that's not the student's fault. So we can't just say, as I heard a group of historians say when I first got into achieving the dream, well, I can't help it, they can't read. Well, that, no, <laughs> it doesn't go that way. Uh, we have to figure out. Now, not to say, well, you don't have to read and you'll be okay in history, but what we have to do is to figure out how to help those students learn how to get the information that they need to be in a history class. And by the way, maybe we shouldn't be basing everything on them having read the text. So, you know, there's all kinds of pieces in this, but that's a really important is that just because a student didn't have all the opportunities that other students have, doesn't mean we can just kind of put them on a discard pile. Another is that we need to think students can succeed rather than thinking they can't. As she mentioned, I taught a lot of years, like some of you have. And you know by about the second week who is going to have be struggling. They don't know that they got to come to class. They don't know they have to do all the math homework. I mean, they, they don't know. And it's up to us to help them do that in a very positive way. So we've got to believe that students can succeed. And another is realizing that inequity is a problem of practice rather than a problem with students. Now, I could have listed 10 more, but if you just got those and believe them, that will help for this college to create a mindset around equity. But creating the mindset isn't enough. We got to be able to demonstrate that mindset. And we're going to talk more about how to do that. It's a couple of things. First of all, everybody is responsible for this. Everybody on this campus, from the groundskeepers, the custodians, the faculty, the financial aid person, uh, the, um, the bursar, who knows what that word means unless you've been in college. Um, but everybody uh, has to have an awareness of this. So we can't leave anybody out. And we have to have a willingness to look and address student outcomes and disparities at all levels disaggregated by groups. So that means all of the data 
that you share here it needs to be disaggregated by ethnicity, by gender, by pill status, IR person. <laughs> Every, and I know you already do it, right? But you got to look at it. It means that you've got to take it at the department level and at every other way that it can be looked at to see where you're, you have some gaps. And then you've got to consider the fairness of maybe reallocating a few dollars. That doesn't mean that you're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It just means that maybe we're going to need to spend a little more money over here than we've been spending. And maybe, maybe it's, you know, a common one is advisors. Who's the student services people? Maybe it's, <laughs> I know you want me to say that. <laughs> they paid me, by the way, to talk about that now. <laughs> uh, but, but maybe it, it's not just that kind of resource. It's also time resource. It may be that we've got to say, you know, we're really glad they're coming here, but they're not going to know that we haven't always said that you have to talk to somebody before you can register. Now, you probably already do that, but uh, it could be anything like that. We may need to reallocate some time. And then we've got to be willing to examine everything we do through that equity lens. Policies, procedures, practices, norms, values, everything. So remember first it was create the, fact, the equity mindset and now it's demonstrating it. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to go through how you can demonstrate it. I know you've been involved in Pathways since it started in Texas. Some of you may have uh, had the opportunity to go to one of the institutes and serve on the CTC team. At, but, you know, they, this is about the student's journey, if you haven't heard of it. And it is about us connecting everything across the student's journey so that they don't get lost, we help them when they're new, uh, and so on and so forth. And there are four pillars, completion, connection, entry, progress, and completion. And um, I want us to consider what your role as an individual in your department and for the college. And it takes a village. On the piece of paper on your table, you've got on the first side uh, three questions, which we'll get to in a little bit. But you've got a college-wide focus supporting the student's journey. And then on the back are these four pillars. Now I'm going to start with the ones on the back. So what I'm showing you up here is the same thing that's on that list. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of these. But what I'm going to ask you to do as you sit here is consider the things in this list first, and then we'll, have, we'll go through the other four. And I want you to put a check mark by any that you feel your area has anything to do with. So technology, it's going to be a lot of them. And finance, it's going to be a bunch of them because uh, there are a lot of rules set up around a lot of these things. So if your area or you, you feel like you have anything to do with it, put a little check by it. And I'm just going to mention a couple, but I'd like for you to look at the whole list. One might be that first one, pre-admission, timeline, so on and so forth. And I'm going to guess that coding issue that you brought up, uh, it's, it's a coding issue because it's been that way forever, right? And maybe we haven't gotten everybody that has to do with that coding issue in the room together 
to talk about how does that coding issue affect students? And so how might we make any change in our system in order to make that coding issue better? So that, that admissions issue touches finance, it touches technology, it touches student services, it touches academics, it touches everybody. So, so that, that uh, and, and those things have a real impact on equity. Because everybody can't just write a check. So we really need to think about what might be some things that are happening that are making these things difficult for some portion of our students and what can we do to make it better. And it's going to take a whole group of people talking about that to make it different. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, because I'm looking at her, um, getting this down. If there's anybody out there that's looking at this remotely, we don't want you to be left out. So I'm going to ask you to be making notes too. You don't have this handout, but you can make notes about what you think is important and then relay that back here uh, to the people. Orientation. I know colleges that require every new student to go to orientation, and they even have options for parents to come. Palo Alto College in San Antonio, which is probably 90% Hispanic, has orientation opportunities for parents and husbands and children, because husbands can keep wives from being successful or being able to come. Uh, and we know that children have their own challenges when their parents are going to college. So here's here's the first one, connection. And if we don't get them started right, we're not going to keep them. Okay. Entry, second pillar. Look down through this one. Now that individual education plan for every single entering student is probably one of the most important things for students. And that doesn't mean I just pick out uh, a, a program plan out of the catalog. No, no, no. It means it's my, it's my individual action plan. It has my name on it. It's captured somewhere. I can see how I progress through it. It's my roadmap. It's my checkoff sheet. It makes all the difference in the world. Online student Support. Remember, we have more than 4,000 students that are online. And what can you be doing for them, in particular, for their needs? And maybe it's something as simple as reaching out to every single one of them at the end of the first week to say, you know, are you signed down? Are you doing okay? And, and that's pretty much just a form email that can be sent if you if you're not doing that already. Meeting with an advisor during the first semester, not just to get started, but before registration the second time. That's entry. Find yourself in there. Lots of things in there for every area. Progress. And we typically think that's getting through 75% of my program requirements. And by the way, we should think that every student that comes here is coming here to complete a program. Maybe they're not, but we should think they are because a lot of them come here thinking, well, I'm going to see, I'm going to take a few classes and see how this goes. And I've got to think I'm going to be here for the whole program in order to begin to believe it. So it's important that we think that. Got some in here for faculty, and they're really important. Faculty focus on persistence endeavors. There are a lot of things that faculty do that help students see themselves staying, even if it's a little challenging. 
And the faculty have a big piece in that. Big piece in that. Um, tutoring. I know you've got a tutoring center. You've probably got a math center. You've got a writing center. you got all those things. How much are they used? And who are they used by? Are they used by the people that can make it anyway? Because the students that really need those things probably don't come. And you may say, well, they work. They can't get here. It's amazing. If you tell students they need to have the writing center review their, uh, their, their uh, theme, their writing assignment at least once in the first two themes, they'll do it. They'll do it, but you got to require it. You got to require it, and you set that up at the beginning. You put it in the syllabus, and then it's an expectation. And you can do that. You know, when we first started talking about all this, the coordinating board said, "Well, I don't know. You know, that's I don't know if we can do that. You can. It's like putting assignments in the syllabus. You can put it in there." I need to move along. Completion. And these are as important as the others. If you don't, you should have an automatic graduation process. So I'm going to be given my uh, completion unless I say I don't want it. That's just one example. And here's a whole list that are college-wide. And I know you can all can find yourself in here. Got to analyze that entry and exit enrollment point data and see who who uh, did an application but never did anything else. Uh, who might have done whatever testing you require and didn't do anything else. Uh, who might have registered but didn't pay by that breakdown by ethnicity. And see what what that says. And you mentioned training, and training is really, really, really important. Really important. So we, it's five after four, and I'd like to, but because, let me mention, and I'm going to give her a chance to talk in a little bit, Dr. Carter, do you all know that she's your chief diversity officer? Everybody, see, they know. <laughs> they know Dr. Carter. And, you know, I talked to Dr. Carter, and she's been doing this since early 2020. But I don't know that there's been a real focus on creating an uh, equity mindset or demonstrating one. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, because this is going to go to her, she's the leader, but she's got to have all of you with her and then everybody else on the college campus. So, you know, I said the first three questions up there are kind of what I asked you to consider while I was going through them. But what I'd like for you to do, and these three questions are on your sheet, is on this paper, big sheets of paper, with each table, identify an answer for each of these one, two, threes, write them down, we're going to gather it up, and that'll be sort of the start of considering how to put together some strategies that will become an equity plan. So, you know, don't think lofty, lofty, what, you know, it's going to take four years to do something. No, 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 no. Think about what might be something that could be done in this year that could make a difference for our students, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and write them down. And we'll come back together in about eh, five minutes before the end of our time together. So go. Good suggestions. Come on. I'm 
conversation. Um, anybody, let, final thoughts, and please finish out what you've got, get it so that it can be understood by uh, those that look at your, your sheets. In fact, if you don't mind, if you put one of your names on your sheet, and then if there's a question about what you were saying, They'll know who to call, not to make you do it, but to, but to just ask you about it. But any final thoughts? I'm going to ask Dr. Carter to come up and um, give you her thoughts. And to, I know she's going to encourage you, if you're interested in being one of the leaders of some of these things, she'd love you to volunteer. And so she's going to end this. I'll just say uh, that it's been great to be here and I'll be back one more time and I'll look forward to all the things you're going to be doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Fabianke. Um, when I got the call uh, from Julie, an email that she was wanting to speak about, about DEI, I have to tell you the truth, I shrunk in my seat. Uh, DEI is an additional duty, but it's something that I am passionate about. Um, and everybody is working. And so I remember when the chancellor gave me this awesome opportunity to excel. That's what I say whenever he gives me the opportunity. Uh, I said, I need some folks. I need some people. Uh, okay, but you don't have a budget. You know? <laughs> but I said, we can get this done. We can start. We can get this done. Grassroots, baby steps. I just need some people. And so in the beginning, people were excited. 
But then life happened, full-time jobs happened, and I don't believe in bothering people too much, Mark and Ted, uh, outside of work, <laughs> with the exception of those two and Bob Liberty and Holly Jordan and Tracy Graves. And so, um, Cliff Gaines, I'm not leaving you out. But, uh, so it was a little slow moving, um, then obviously COVID, but I'm just, I'm not gonna blame anything on COVID because we could still do some things. So what we did initially was, um, and, and what I want to say, Dr. Fabianchi, thank you so much, because what you did was you provoked us uh, concerning an equity mindset and that this is not just the chief diversity officer's issue, it is our issue. Just before I came, I got a call from a department chair and said, who said, uh, this is what I'm faced with. What's the policy? What do I do? I said, I don't know. You know, I'm a middle-aged woman. I don't even know what you're talking about pretty much. But so, um, you know, so we've, we've, we've got some multi-generational things going on here too, but I just believe that collectively we can figure it out, right? So, um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I believe it was President Roosevelt, rest his soul, who said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's what an equity mindset is. It's, it's change management. People, some people are born with it. You know, they just live that way. But some of us, we need some tools. But one of the things that I wanted to share with you because Dr. Fabianke talked about demonstrating equity. And so I, I want to challenge you to start looking at things through an equity lens. Okay. Well, how do you get to 2020 with your equity lens? Ask yourself a few questions. When you enter a room for a meeting, event, or activity, who's missing and why? I, I scan the room a lot when I walk into it. And I can quickly tell you that there's a percentage, this percent of women, there's this percent of black, I only see this, I only see that. I scan the room and then I wonder why aren't they here? Who's not here at our party, right? Number two, who is disproportionately impacted by my decision to do whatever it is that I do? Whatever practice I decide to implement whatever grading system I use, whatever it is that I'm doing, who's disproportionately impacted? And then take a moment to, to, to digest that and maybe rethink how you're gonna do whatever it is you're doing. And then number three, what populations are overlooked if I make this policy procedure or implement this practice? Uh, Holly Jordan, <laughs> I know you're watching Holly. Uh, whenever we review HR policies, um, Holly is really good about identifying groups who may be disproportionately impacted by something that we do. She's constantly thinking about the continental sites and people in the service area and the folks in Europe. And she knows what just about everybody does. So she, she's really good about that. So I would challenge you in that to, to think that way. I can tell you that um, in my mind, an equity mindset, it's a non-negotiable. It's not something that you get to take or leave, especially when we're talking about our students. I appreciate the fact that you said it's everybody's responsibility, including the groundskeeper, because they take great pride in, in what they do in making sure that the students have a beautiful campus. Um, when we initially started, uh, the, the chancellor sent out a communication. We had the council for uh, the, the council for uh, inclusive excellence. I was really excited because I thought I was going to get about 10, 15 people, and we were going to we we're going to make all kinds of changes. And I mean, I was excited. Maybe all zeal, no knowledge. I don't know. Just foolish, maybe. And it didn't happen because guess what? People had jobs. People had families. You know, all of that good stuff. So then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to put together a task force. Let me see what'll happen. No, no, that didn't happen either because I wanted a task force that would help me uh, create a framework, a, a DEI strategic plan, you know, everybody's busy. 
So then I said, you know, forget about it. I'm just going to start going to people. I have partners. I have partners. I'm going to get to that council one day. But right now I have partners. And one of them is the fabulous Dr. Tracy Cook. I talked to Tracy um, late spring, was it? I invited you to my office and I shared with her my vision. And Tracy, she digested, she listened. Uh, I appreciated that about her. She said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Not like I'm going to say no. She said yes, but she had, she had to research because she doesn't do anything halfway. And I appreciate that. So one of the reasons I called Tracy is because there are three things that I would like to do in fiscal year 2023. One, I want to do an equity audit of our policies and procedures. I've been doing some one-offs with HR, campus police, and that sort of thing, but I want to do an equity audit. I need a committee for that, just anybody wants to be a part. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do was provide faculty and staff training and resource opportunities, particularly a resource page on our website, because we do have a web page. If, if you haven't seen it, we do have a web page where we uh, post events and other information. And so Dr. Cook, I'm patiently waiting, uh, but I know when she's ready, um, she's, she's going to get back to me. She's currently working. She's given, she gave me a progress report, and it's going to be good because I really wanted the faculty to have resources at your fingertips to, uh, to, to do this work and to, to help you in your classrooms with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Dr. Fabianca being here today was a bit fortuitous, and so I was really excited after I, you know, sat straight up in my chair after shrinking, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. And so this is that. It's, it's small, but this is that training. This is that training um, in education that we talked about. And then finally, a newsletter. Uh, I, like I said, we have a web page, but I'm going to start a newsletter also this fall, whereby we'll include you, but we'll, we'll share with you updates. We'll highlight something. Um, I've got it sketched out. And that committee, my partners, I'll talk to them about it, and uh, and then we'll see what that looks like. Gonna, again, baby steps, baby steps. But I would ask you, if you have any questions or suggestions about anything, please contact me. You can email me, mcarter or diversity at ctcd.edu. I so appreciated. I hope she's not. She doesn't get upset, but I so appreciated it when Catherine Oser contacted me today because she had a very real issue. I didn't have a very real answer, but I'm gonna get her one. I plan to get her an answer. But I just appreciated the fact that she wasn't doing a lot of talking about it elsewhere, but that she called me and is giving me an opportunity to address it. That means a lot to me. You have no idea how much that means to me because in this role, I'm here at your, I, I serve. I'm here to serve you and to help this college get where we need to be. So Dr. Fabianke, thank you. Um, forgive me if it seemed like I was rambling, but I didn't want to miss an opportunity to, to say anything. And thank you to each of you for being here today. And for those of you online um, here with us virtually, it says a lot about you. It says a lot about you and your commitment to our student success. So thank you. Thank y'all for being here. As Dr. Carter said, the, the work that, that you're doing says a lot about your intention to continue this work um, at CTC. Um, I appreciate you writing on the pads. We'll, we'll collect those. You don't have to worry about ripping them off or anything. We'll, we'll collect all those up. We're going to compile all that. And as I said earlier, we're going to use this information to help us uh, achieve our goal of getting the $250,000 grant from the coordinating board so that we can continue this. And, and Dr. Carter's already asked me if she had some of that fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for you guys. But uh, thank you again for being here. I know most of my team will be involved in the um, September 30th event also. Um, if, if you just really want to come to that, let me know. I'll be happy to host you. It's going to be more focused on the student services and student success side, but anybody that's not on the academic and student uh, 
success team and you want to come to the September 30th, just let me know. It will be the same. Dr. Fabian and I are going to work on uh, it, in focusing it more in the student services and student success area. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate your time. And don't forget to pick up a book. What, Julie? Oh, oh yes, and, and please fill out the evaluation. We need that to report back on the grant. Please fill that out. You can just leave it on the table or hand it to myself, Julie, or uh, Gilda over there. Uh, that's fine. And please take a look. Thank y'all so much. <laughs>